After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound key. So this is a new experience for me, so um, I'm looking forward to this as well. So um, my name is uh, Sarah Gray, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George. And I'm a biomedical researcher, or a lab-based researcher, who is interested in um, obesity and type 2 diabetes. That's my area of interest. Today, um, I really want to thank the Canadian Diabetes Association, and actually in particular, I'd really like to thank Boyan Young, who is the um, manager of the Northern BC Yukon branch, for inviting me to give this uh, webinar today, which is titled Road to a Cure. And um, um, today, so um, prior to this session, I sent out some learning objectives for the session, and so I'll just go through those now. I hope that um, by the end of this session, I will have been able to that you will be able to understand that the impact the impact diabetes is having in Canada and in the world, that you will understand a little bit better some of the biology behind why insulin is not present or is not working in patients with diabetes. I hope that you will be able to identify or know a little bit more about some of the key challenges facing researchers searching for a cure. And of course, I hope that you will have learned about some of the recent exciting advances in research today that are bringing us within reach of a cure for diabetes. So also, I guess I should thank all of you for being present at this webinar tonight on Easter Monday. So thank you for coming. Um, like I said, I normally um, give presentations where the audience is present, and so I can gauge a little bit better, um, say, the amount of detail people would like, or we can ask questions throughout. That's not the format here tonight. So um, I am going to talk about research areas that are going on today uh, related to diabetes in broad areas. But I, at the end of my talk, I am going to focus in on some some specific studies that have been published, say, in the last year or so, or two years, that are, have really made key strides in moving us towards a cure. And so if those areas are too detailed for people, I apologize for that. And if there are people out there who want more detail, I'm more than happy for you to contact my, me by email and we can continue the discussions at a later date. So um, diabetes is really a very big problem in our world today. In 2013, um, it is um, predicted by the International Diabetes Federation that about 382 million people are living with diabetes. And these numbers fluctuate a little bit depending where you look. But I want to bring your attention to this graph that I've put up, which was actually published in 2006. And at this time, it was predicted that by 2030, that 366 million people would have diabetes. So it's very clear that we are rapidly outpacing the predictions um, that were made um, back in 2006. And um, it was in 2006 that the World Health Organization declared diabetes an epidemic, and at that time, the president of the International Diabetes Federation said that diabetes will overwhelm sorry, healthcare. Sorry. Oh, sorry? Oh. <laughs> will overwhelm healthcare resources everywhere if governments do not wake up and take action now. And in Canada, we're not immune from these very high prevalence rates. In 2010, it was predicted that about 3 million Canadians are living with diabetes, with another 6 million with prediabetes, costing our country about $12.2 billion a year. And um, I apologize for those of you who are outside British Columbia listening, but I wanted to bring that number close to home for those of us here in BC. We have very similar rates of diabetes in BC compared to the national average. So as a researcher then, um, we, these h very high prevalence rates need help us to think about what Ron. the goals of research are. Hi, Ron. <laughs> um, number one, diabetes research needs to obviously improve patient health and the quality of life of those living with diabetes. But it also needs to reduce the burden of diabetes on global health. So diabetes research focuses on management. So for example, just recently in 2013, the Canadian Diabetes Association published a new clinical practice guidelines which will help us to manage diabetes to the most current standards. But diabetes research also needs to focus on prevention and cure so that we can ultimately try to reduce the prevalence rates uh, that are occurring um, for diabetes in the world today. So I've, I've 
Today I'm going to really be highlighting some of the biomedical research that's going on related to diabetes. And that's really just because that's my world. Um, there are other areas of diabetes research, including clinical research, for example, drug trials that are going on um, with in patients with type 2 diet or type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes to um, for the development of new ther uh, therapeutics. And there is also a lot of research going on with a focus on community or population health. These areas of research are just as important, and um, but I, so I don't mean to exclude them. It's just that this is my area of expertise, so this is where I'm going to focus talking about today. But biomedical research, really, and clinical research and community population health research, all interacts to have an overall goal of improving and personalizing healthcare. Oops. So. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So I just have a definition here for biomedical research. So you understand what I'm talking about when I say biomedical research. It's the area of science devoted to the study of the processes of life, the prevention and treatment of disease, and the genetic and environmental factors related to disease and health. So biomedical research is really predominantly lab-based research that's really trying to understand the biology behind the disease. And I've included these pictures here because I think these really sort of capture biomedical, re when we think about biomedical research, this is what we really think about. So it's research that's going on in the lab, in the test tube, in cells that are in culture, or in animal models of disease, including rodent models. But of course, as a biomedical researcher, the goal of my research group is not to cure diabetes in a mouse. And so we have to remember that the results that we generate from biomedical research in the lab need to move from the bench to the bedside where they have an impact on human health. So we raise a lot of funds for biomedical research, and I've just included some pictures here from different charitable organizations. The government also supplies or allocates a lot of funds for research. So organizations like the Canadian Diabetes Association raise funds, and part of their mandate is to fund, um, fund research, including biomedical research. So as a diabetes researcher, I get questions like, is the investment in biomedical research worth it? Has biomedical research improved the way we treat and manage diabetes? And are we close to a cure for diabetes? So fortunately, in the field of diabetes, we really don't need to look far to find or to, to, to um, realize the impact that biomedical research has had on this disease. So, and of course, I'm talking about the discovery of insulin that happened in 1921. So prior to that time, diabetes really was an acutely lethal disease, and after that biomedical discovery, diabetes became a chronic disease that people lived with. So I just want to take a few minutes, not too long, but just a couple of minutes to reflect on that success of biomedical research in the world of diabetes. So because we as Canadians should be extremely proud of this um, biomedical success in that it occurred at the University of Toronto in 1921. And this picture here is the team of researchers that were, um, that were directly involved in that discovery. So this is a picture of Dr. McLeod, who was the head of the Department of Physiology at the time at the University of Toronto, and he granted Dr. Banting, who was a surgeon, a physician, and his summer student, Charles Best, he granted them lab space and funds to carry out their experiments. Dr. Banting, um, building on research that had been done by other diabetes researchers, he felt that there was um, an, a secretion from the pancreas that was lacking in diabetics, and he had an idea for a technique to isolate that secretion. So in 1921, he and Charles Best worked in the lab on diabetic, using diabetic dogs to extract that um, secretion. And then that extract that contained the secretion, which we now know was insulin, was given back to diabetic dogs, and he was able to reverse the symptoms of diabetes in these dogs. Very quickly, they were granted permission to try these extracts in humans, patients with type 
uh, with type 1 diabetes. And it was at that time that James Collip, a biochemist from the University of Alberta, joined the team to help to purify those ac extracts so they would be suitable for um, administration to human patients. So in 1922, the first patients, um, um, the first patients to receive those extracts, dramatic results happened. So they were able to reverse the symptoms of diabetes with daily insulin treatment. And because of these very exciting results, Dr. Banting and Dr. McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1923. So this is that famous picture of Leonard Thompson, who was the first patient to receive insulin. Um, at the, t this, the time this photograph was taken, in 1922, he weighed 25 pounds and was near death. And shortly, af shortly after receiving the extracts, his health dramatically improved. So it was this um, insulin therapy that, prior to insulin therapy, a child diagnosed with type 1 diabetes li lived for less than 12 months. But with daily insulin therapy, um, it became a chronic disease. And Leonard Thompson actually went on to live for an additional 13 years. He died at 26 or 27 from a pneumonia. But other patients within that first cohort, like Ted Ryder, survived for 71 years on insulin therapy. So it really was an incredible discovery that had a significant impact on, hum on the human um, condition. But as many of you know who are in the, or listening tonight, that insulin therapy is not a cure, and it has now been used to treat diabetes for 92 years. Um, so what's going on in diabetes research to today to take us past that, to take us closer to a cure? And what I hope I will impress on you, impress upon you tonight is that all sorts of areas of biology are being studied in the context of diabetes research. So we have physicians and surgeons who are trying to improve, for example, islet transplant protocols. There are bioengineers. Oh, hello. Um, with there are bioengineers who are trying to improve insulin delivery systems or even develop artificial pancreas. There are developmental biologists working on stem cell research immunologists who are trying to understand why autoimmune conditions happen and how we can suppress the immune system more safely, for example, after islet transplants. And then there's physiologists like myself who are trying to understand how, why beta cells fail in conditions like obesity or why insulin resistance develops. Even people who are looking at therapies for some of the risk factors for diabetes, like anti-obesity therapies. And in the last couple of years, we even have microbiologists who have identified for us that the, the bacteria populating the gut seems to have a significant impact on how metabolic disease um, is acquired. So all sorts of different areas, and clearly tonight, I'm not going to be able to touch on all those different areas. So I'm going to select a few different areas um, where current research is going on, and I'm going to highlight some specific studies, um, sort of significant studies that have happened very recently um, that I feel have made a, a significant contribution to the field. And before I go on, I just wanted to also highlight, um, you know, I, I wanted to highlight the discovery of insulin because, of course, that happened in Canada. But today, Canadian diabetes researchers really at the, are at the forefront of diabetes uh, research. They have remained there since the discovery. And there's all sorts of people working across this country on this problem. And so I just want to highlight there's some of the larger centers. So at, in Vancouver at UBC, we have a diabetes research group um, with people like Tim Kiefer and Garth Warnock. Jim Johnson at the Alberta Diabetes Institute, um, people like Dr. McLeod, um, Patrick McLeod, and Peter Light and Kathy Chan. We also have, obviously, a large group at the University of Toronto, and they're still doing wonderful work there at the University of Toronto, also the Montreal Diabetes Research Group, and many other smaller centers. I've put myself there in Prince George, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, Sherbrooke, and this is by no means complete, but I just wanted you to understand that although I'm going to highlight a few studies tonight, there's lots of really great work being done right across Canada, each group contributing little pieces to the puzzle. Okay, so for the remainder of my talk then, I want, I'm going to ask you guys to think a little bit about biology. And I apologize, I know that's a little heavy for Easter Monday, but I do want you to think a little bit about biology. 
because um, as a researcher, this is what I think about. So I ask myself all the time, what's going on in the body to cause diabetes? Because I feel like if I understand what's happening in the body with the development or progression of diabetes, if I really understand that well, then there may be opportunities for us to intervene so that we can ad identify new therapeutics or even a cure. So a diagnosis for diabetes is fasting hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar. But that's really the end result. That's the consequence of diabetes. So a definition for diabetes would be a chronic disease resulting from defective insulin secretion, insulin action, or both. And diabetes is not just one disease, it's a cluster of diseases. Um, and so the absence of insulin is caused by a variety of different things. Again, I'm not going to talk about all the different types of diabetes, but I did want to highlight for you sort of the biology or what's going on in the two main types of diabetes, which is type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Okay, so I'm going to use this slide for throughout the remainder of my talk just to sort of remind you about some of sort of, I guess, the underlying biology. So in this individual here, um, we have an organ, or in all individuals, we have an organ called the pancreas, which really has two jobs within the body. Number one, it makes digestive enzymes, and number two, there are cells within the pancreas that are located in these, these clusters of cells called islets that produce hormones that help to regulate metabolism. And one of those cell types is called a beta cell. And here in this picture, that's the pink cells. And beta cells produce a very important hormone called insulin. And when insulin is made by the pancreas, it then gets sent out in the blood to act on other cells with, ar around the body, and it helps those cells to take up sugar and use it as fuel. So in type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition. And what do I mean by that? The immune system, for some reason, recognizes these pink cells or these pancreatic beta cells as strangers or foreign. And they, the immune system then attacks these cells and destroys them. So in type 1 diabetes, the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas are destroyed, and that leads to an absence of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the underlying cause is a little different. So in this case, the insulin that is produced by the pancreatic beta cells for some reason, in most cases of type 2 diabetes, for some reason, it doesn't work very well in these peripheral tissues. And a condition called insulin resistance develops. And when the insulin's not working very well in these cells, the pancreas then says, oh, the insulin's not working, I better make more insulin. And for a time, or in some individuals, this can carry on for quite a long time. But in most people, the pancreas the beta cells of the pancreas sort of get tired from overproducing this insulin, and ultimately they fail. So in type 2 diabetes then, we have defects in the way insulin is working, and we also have in defects in the way insulin is being made, but the end result is similar. We don't have enough insulin to do the job and to main metabolic homeostasis. So although the end point can be quite similar in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the underlying causes are different. And therefore, research focused on these two different types of diabetes often focuses on different area, areas of the biology. Okay, so diabetes research is going on all along this pathway. Some people are looking at risk factors for the disease. Others are looking at ways to replace those insulin-producing cells. Other people are looking at ways to replace that insulin, and others are looking at areas of insulin sensitivity. So I'd like to now just go through a few examples um, of some of those areas of research um, that um, I've selected to be sort of very... Pat Stefani? Um, oh, hello? <laughs> so just some of the areas that I have feel are quite important or have made significant advances in the last... Um, last a couple of years. 
Okay, so I'm going to focus first on the replacement of insulin because I think that that's a very easy way to think about, think about the way I'm going to approach this. So in 1921, Dr. Banting identified that the problem was that there was a secretion that was absent in diabetics, and they identified that secretion to be insulin. So the problem was is that insulin was absent, and we now know in, say, type 2 diabetics that perhaps not enough insulin is being made or that insulin's not working. So the solution to this then could be that we will replace insulin or help cells secrete more insulin. And that's exactly what we do now. So in many people with, or most people with type 1 diabetes, we replace that insulin through daily injections or through administration through an insulin pump. In type, many type 2 diabetics, we will use pharmacological or agents or drugs to help the, the remaining cells, the remaining beta cells, to secrete more insulin. Okay, and we use drugs like sulfonylureas or gliburide or incretin agents such as Genubia. Okay, so that's an example of a sort of a problem and a solution. But what about for the future? We don't, unfortunately, when we administer insulin exogenously through injections or through a pump, we don't get that really tight, fine-tuned regulation. So when cells of the body produce insulin, they are able to respond to changes in blood sugar on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Pancreatic beta cells are highly, highly specialized at sensing that glucose, so they can respond in very subtle ways to those, those changes. So in the future then, we really want the body to be able to make its own insulin again. So we, can we ask the question, can we restore a cell population that can produce and secrete insulin on its own in response to those physiological cues? So instead of focusing here on insulin, I want to move back a step and focus on those insulin-producing cells. And this time, I'm going to suggest then that the problem is, is that insulin-producing cells have been destroyed, for example, in type 1 diabetes by autoimmune attack, or the insulin-producing cells are malfunctioning, for example, in obesity. And so the solution then, in this case, could be to replace the insulin-producing cells or restore function of insulin-producing cells. So I'm going to start here and highlight one particular area of research that's currently going on, um, trying to find a way to replace these insulin-producing cells. Okay. So replacement of insulin-producing cells, as many of you or all of you in the room know, we can do that now through whole pancreas or islet transplantation. And again, islet transplantation was a protocol that was developed here in Canada at the University of Alberta, and it's actually called the Edmonton Protocol. It was developed in the year 2000, and it's a very effective therapy for diabetes. Unfortunately, there are a lot of limitations associated with islet transplantation. So islets for islet transplantation must come from donors, and there's not enough islet donors for all diabetics. So actually, very few diabetics are treated with islet transplantation. Also, while islet transplantation does maintain um, insulin independence for patients for several years, Many have been shown ultimately to have graft failure, and patients who receive islets through transplantation have to live on chronic immunosuppression. So there's a fair bit of research going on to, to see if we can overcome some of these limitations. So number one, if we look at that first limitation, can we find a renewable source of beta cells? And this is a question that is being asked by many different researchers um, around the world. Oh, I'm just looking at the chat here, and it says, what is an islet? I hope I was able to explain that. I'm sorry if I didn't. So an islet is a group of cells or a group of hormone-secreting cells that are present within the pancreas. And some of the cells within those islets, a beta cell, are the cells that make insulin. So I hope that, that, I hope that was able to answer your question. Okay, so can we find a renewable source of these insulin-producing cells? 
So um, many people are looking in different areas to try to identify if we could find a renewable source of insulin producing cells. I've mentioned two here on my slide, but I just want to focus in here on stem cells, and that's what I'm going to really spend the next couple of minutes talking about. So what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell within the body that can become any cell. And I apologize if, this anal if, you, if you don't like this analogy, but this is the way that I think about it. So I think about a baby or a toddler that has the potential to become anything it would it, that they would like to become. So they could become a chef later in life, they could become a physician, or they could become a business person. And in biology, we call this ability to become anything pluripotency. So if you hear that word when you're trying to read about research and things like that, that's basically what it means. So if we come back to cells then, rather than babies or toddlers, a stem cell has the ability to become a heart cell, a liver cell, or a pancreatic beta cell. And in the last five to 10 years, there's been quite a lot of work trying to figure out how we can force a stem cell to become a beta cell, or really what we care about is an insulin producing cell. So again, if this is going into too much detail, maybe you guys can, whoever thinks it's too much detail can just make themselves a T right now. But I did want to highlight some specific studies for you. When I, when I was told that I was giving this talk, I think it's always trying to find a balance between too much detail and being too general. So I did want to provide some specific examples. And so I've selected this study here. It's done by a group of researchers at the University of British Columbia, led by Dr. Tim Kiefer and also Dr. Warren and this paper was published in August 2012. And I think it's a really important study um, that has really advanced our understanding of whether or not stem cells are going to be a promising source for, all, for, for generating this renewable source of beta cells. So what this group did was they took these stem cells, remember the cells that can become anything they want, and in the lab they pushed these cells or these stem cells part way to becoming um, insulin producing cells. So if we go back to my toddler analogy, they took these toddlers and then got them all the way, so say we, if we use the analogy of a toddler wanting to become a doctor, they took these toddlers and got them all the way to medical school, okay? And so these cells became part way to becoming insulin producing cells in a petri dish. And then they took these cells and they implanted them or, or transplanted them into a diabetic mouse. And after about 30 wait, weeks, they noticed, noticed some very interesting things happened. Oh. <laughs> oh, I think I've just lost everybody for a minute. Oh, hi, hi there. there. Yeah, hi, I'm back. <laughs> uh, is everything OK? Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, I'll continue on, okay. So um, they transplanted these cells into the kidney of a diabetic mouse, and after about 30 weeks, they saw some interesting things happening. So they looked at these cells, and they noticed that, so in this slide here, cells that are red are making insulin. So number one, they noticed that these cells that they had transplanted did in fact start producing insulin, but they were also forming these aggregates or groups of cells just that started to look just like human islets. And after about 30 weeks, these aggregate cells that were producing insulin reversed diabetes in these mice. So this was a very important study because not only did it show that stem cells could become insulin producing cells, but these insulin producing cells could in fact reverse diabetes in an, in an animal model. So if we then think about what this study did in terms of asking if we could overcome that first limitation, they have gone a long way to showing that stem cells might be a way to overcome that limitation of islet donors because we may be able to produce um, insulin producing cells in the lab and they may continue to develop um, when they've been transplanted.
But of course, if we were to use stem cells in, a, for example, a type 1 diabetic patient, remember we'd be putting these cells back into that very hostile autoimmune environment. So could we overcome these other two limitations? And so more recently, just in the summer of 2013, this same group took, asked this question and took this study a little bit further. And what they did was they used a lot of information that has been generated by a whole variety of other research groups that have been looking at ways to protect pancreatic islets that have been transplanted from this autoimmune environment. And I just want to point out here, my slide is missing a key feature here, I think there's just been a glitch, is there should be islets in this beige circle, okay? <laughs> so I apologize for that. So this type of research is called encapsulation. And what it would do, it would put islets in a little protective capsule that would protect them from the immune attack. So these capsules will have to have a membrane that allows glucose and nutrients and oxygens to pass through so those cells can stay alive. And then in the, any insulin that's made from those cells needs to be able to get back out of that membrane so that it can go and act in the body to regulate blood sugar. But this membrane would, would keep out any of the immune cells and protect those islets from the autoimmune attack. So this same group, led by Tim Kiefer, has now done the same protocol that they did before, but instead of implanting these progenitor cells in the kidney, they've put them in one of these encapsulation devices. And they've found that the similar things happen, that these cell aggregates um, form, that insulin is made by these cells, and it can go ahead and reverse diabetes in the mouse. So I think this is a really exciting example of a group who, over the last couple of years, has really made some significant strides to really test whether or not stem cells are an, a, will potentially be a future cure or therapeutic for um, diabetes. So I next want to talk, go back to talking about, I'm going to give you an example of a study that instead of focusing on the replacement of insulin producing cells, is looking to try to restore function of beta cells that are left, for example, in type 2, type 2 diabetics or patients with prediabetes. So, this is the area of research that I'm actually interested in as well. And in obesity, we know that pancreatic beta cells don't function prop properly. So we, if we ask ourselves, why does pancreatic beta cell function deteriorate in obesity, perhaps we could intervene and try to keep beta cells healthy despite obesity. And this is exactly what a group at the University of Ottawa has done very, very recently, actually. This paper was published in March of 2014, and it's a group led by Dr. Screeton at the University of Ottawa. Now, I told you before that in obesity or in type 2 diabetes, a condition called insulin resistance develops. So that insulin that's made by healthy islets or insulin-producing cells of the pancreas, it just doesn't work properly. And in response to that, beta cells at first will actually start to make more insulin, and we call this beta cell compensation. So actually, initially, they make even more insulin. And this group here, this group of researchers, has just recently identified a particular protein, and we can just call it the blue protein for now, but a particular protein that is very highly expressed in islets that are in this compensatory phase. And more interestingly than that, they noticed that this blue protein goes away if we look at islets that have failed or are no longer able to maintain that high level of insulin production, the ones that got tired. So they suggest that if we could preserve this expression of this protein, they, we could actually prevent beta cell failure from happening. And that's exactly what they've been able to show right now in a rodent model. So again, this is very preliminary work, but it highlights a very exciting 
new avenue to explore for new therapeutics for patients with type 2 diabetes. Because if we could freeze the beta cell in that sort of pre-diabetic state, then early pre-diabetic state, then we may be able to maintain beta cell function either indefinitely or for a longer amount of time despite um, the development of insulin resistance. Okay, so I'm almost there. I just have one more example for you. So I hope I hope um, I'm I, people are interested still and that um, that you're you're with me. So I have one more example for you because I wanted to try to span the breadth of diabetes research. And so the last area that I'm going to focus on is this insulin resistant state. So remember what I said in type 2 diabetes, one of the precipitating factors for type 2 diabetes seems to be this development of insulin resistance, or insulin doesn't work very well in the body. So the problem is insulin resistance, so then the solution then could be ways to try to restore insulin sensitivity. Now, nowadays we do have uh, pharmacological agents or drugs that help to restore insulin sensitivity in, um, in, uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes. So many of you are familiar with the drug metformin. Metformin works in some ways to restore insulin sensitivity because it improves the way our liver responds to insulin. And others of you may be familiar with a drug called rosiglitazone, or may, you may have heard of it as a Vandia, that was actually a very potent insulin sensitizer. Unfortunately, rosiglitazone or Avandia in 2007 was also identified to cause, have the potential to cause cardiovascular side effects. And so nowadays, rosiglitazone is not prescribed widely. But researchers are still on the hunt for new insulin sensitizers. And there's one that has, has um, been given a lot of attention recently. I was at a conference in January that, where there was a lot, of t a lot of talk about a new target that may be a new insulin sensitizer on the market shortly. So, and, and again, I don't need you to know a lot of details, but I just wanted to introduce you to some of this language that's going on. So FGF21 is the new target. And FGF21 is a protein that in rodents, and I'm going to highlight in rodents, has for the last couple of years has been shown to be able to induce some pretty significant effects on metabolic disease. So activation of FGF21 can induce very potent anti-diabetic effects. It can also have potent lipid lowering effects, so it can lower cholesterol. And it also has significant weight reducing effects. So this seems like a fairly promising target for a new therapeutic, but not much work yet has been done in humans until just this year. So in this year, there have been two studies that have come up out by a company, actually, by Lilly, who are, sh are showing some of the very first results of targeting this protein in humans. And these results have just come from a few weeks trial, it's not long-term therapy yet, but they have been able to show that FGF21 in humans does have similar weight reducing effects and lipid lowering potential. And the anti-diabetic effects, they have only so far been able to show modest, modest effects, but remember this trial was only a few weeks long. And so by being able to improve these factors here in the long term, perhaps maybe after a couple of months of therapy, they may also be successful at causing anti-diabetic effects. So I just wanted to put this one on your radar because I think in the next couple of years, we're going to hear more and more about this um, potential candidate and whether or not it might make it as a potential therapeutic for metabolic disease um, such as obesity and diabetes. And right now there's not only, not only Lily's working on this, but several, several companies have several agents uh, that are currently in clinical trial and may one day become the next sort of target for uh, insulin sensitizers. Okay, so I hope that throughout this I've been able to show you that by understanding the biology, there's all sorts of different areas of diabetes research going on that may lead to improved therapeutics or a cure for diabetes. And obviously I didn't have time to talk about all these different areas today. We focused on the use of stem cells to replace these insulin-producing cells. 
We also talked a little bit about restoring or preserving beta cell function in prediabetes or conditions like obesity. And we also talked about the potential for identifying new drugs that could sensitize the body to insulin. But there's all sorts of other areas going on. And um, diabetes researchers around the world and in Canada are working hard to put these little jigsaw pieces, uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces together. So in conclusion then, I hope that I have been able to, uh, to convince you that diabetes is a significant global health issue. I actually don't think this is the audience that I need to convince that of. That diabetes is a cluster of diseases that has un different underlying causes. I also hope that you have understood or you can take away from this that diabetes is really a very complex biological condition. And so researchers then must overcome many hurdles in the road to a cure. And I hope that I've been able to convince you that there are many exciting advances in research that are being made around the world and here in Canada. And I'm very sure that these advances will contribute to improved therapeutics and a cure for diabetes in the near future. Um, and I'm just going to put up here the references. These are the specific references of those studies that I talked about in a bit more detail. And for anyone, like I say, that would be interested in getting a hold of these papers or doing any more reading, please just contact me and I'm happy by email and I'm happy to try to send these on to, uh, on to you or anybody else that might be interested. So again, thank you so much for your, um, your attention. Um, I hope I've been able to pitch it at the right level for you and any feedback in that regard would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay. Um, I've just noticed that I've had uh, two questions come in at the bottom of our chat here. Oh, yeah. Um, one is, uh, why do some obese people become diabetic and others do not? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I work on obesity and diabetes. And it, it's a very, very interesting observation that actually has driven a lot of my research. Because while we can say that about 80% of type 2 diabetics are overweight or obese, many, many fewer obese individuals are diabetic. And so um, there's many different sort of hypotheses or ideas out there why people with diabetes may, um, sorry, why people with obesity may develop diabetes. And I'm just going to share one of, you, one of those ideas with you today. So um, the other thing that you'll notice about um, when we think about obesity and diabetes, there doesn't seem to be sort of a threshold of weight to gain before you get diabetes. So you'll have an individual that may weigh 300 pounds and be metabolically healthy. But then you have another person that, you know, you know, has suddenly gets a new job and has to spend a bit too much time in front of their computer. They put on, say, 10 to 15 pounds, and they develop diabetes. So it's not an absolute amount of weight. And so one of the things that my lab has really been interesting is this idea of how capable adipose tissue or fat tissue is to um, to expand in, in um, to, ex to co accommodate excess calories. And it seems like if your fat tissue can expand greatly to take up that fat tissue, fat is actually a really great place to store excess calories. It stores it nice and safely. But if your fat can't expand very much, then you get this idea of lipid spillover. And what happens is instead of the lipid that instead of the lipid accumulating in fat, it starts to build up in other tissues like liver or skeletal muscle. And you've probably heard of fatty liver and how bad for you fatty liver is. Mm -hmm. And so we, we think that when lipid accumulates in these other tissues that it can cause problems. And the beta cell is one of these cells that can have lipid accumulate in it. So we think that for people who's sort of fat tissue doesn't expand very well, that this lipid starts getting stored in other tissues where it shouldn't. And this is maybe why these people are more susceptible to developing diabetes than others. And I know that was a bit long-winded, but that's one area that I'm quite interested no, in. No, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and there's another one. So I'm just going to scroll here. Um, so 
So next one is by Mark uh, Blackell. Mm -hmm. um, is there any specific research into the type 2 onset in non-obese patients? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's a lot of individuals. So again, I don't want to focus on obesity and type 2 diabetes because, of course, there's a lot of individuals who develop type 2 diabetes who are not overweight and obese. And, um, and again, that may be due to sort of failure of beta cell function. And so that second study that I talked about, um, trying to sort of preserve beta cell function, um, is very relevant not only to type 2 diabetics who have obesity, but individuals who have type 2 diabetes that may result, say, from a fundamental defect in beta cell function. There are, we talked a little bit of, with focusing on stem cells about the replacement of um, beta cells. Well, another sort of area of research that's in that vein is trying to encourage beta cells that remain in type 2 diabetic, so for example, a non-obese type 2 diabetic that just has a few pancreatic beta cells left. Could we target those beta cells and get them to um, proliferate or divide so that we can grow beta cells back within that individual. And, and there's a lot of people who are working on sort of understanding how beta cells divide and replicate and could we induce that in patients with type 2 diabetes. And of course, individuals who are non-obese, we want to understand what goes wrong with their beta cells. Why do the beta cells become non-functional? And if we understood that, then we might be able to intervene again. Great, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to scroll to the next one here. Um, what is the relationship of diabetes and sleep apnea? This is by SEC. Yeah, now that one might stump me a little bit, and I apologize. <laughs> Maybe I will try to look up a little bit later. So um, I'm very aware of the association between obesity and sleep apnea, but I'm not actually sure, and you, like you as the audience would probably know better than me, about non-obese diabetics and sleep apnea, apnea if there's a connection. So I apologize that I don't know the answer to that. Um, but in terms of obesity, we do know that there's a strong connection between being overweight and obese with sleep apnea. But I think... I think, I'm sorry, I, d I don't know if I have the answer in terms of a mechanism for that one. No problem. <laughs> uh, the next one is by Jim Bates. Um, what do we call HBS caused by neuroglycopenia? Sorry, I probably butchered that word. <laughs> oh, what do we call HBS? I'm not sure if I understand that acronym. Um, caused by neuroglycopenia. Oh, I might need Jim to elaborate a little bit for that question for me. Maybe he can do no. that, and then we can come back to him. <laughs> no problem. Jim, okay. you can just type over there. Okay, um, sorry. And then another one just by Eva. Um, you mentioned, I guess, this is followed by email, so I don't sure. know if the yeah. diabetes site had your email, if you just want to type it in there for them. Sure, I can definitely. So if I put it um, in the Q&A site or the chat box? Is that just that? in the chat box will be okay, fine. Okay, sure. Yeah. Great, and I can see that uh, Jim is going to type a follow-up okay. there. <laughs> oh, I hope I can answer. Uh, there we <laughs> go. That's my email address. And I think someone else had asked if I could send my slides out. Um, I'm more than happy to share them if people would like them. So um, yeah, and I'll check with um, I'll check with the Diabetes Association. I don't quite know if they um, post them, them up or not on the website, okay. but I'll, we'll get that figured out. Okay, thanks. Um, and I have a question from Leanne. Oh yeah, okay. Do you know anything about a possible cure for type 1 using large doses of vitamin D? Yeah, that's a very interesting, and I, again, I don't know if I have a specific answer for you, but this has been a very interesting area. So vitamin D has really inf infiltrated a lot of different areas of biomedical research these days. Um, so vitamin D seems to be good all round, and um, type 1 diabetes is an example of where vitamin D supplementation has been suggested as um, a potentially slowing the progression, as what I understand it is slowing the progression of type 1 diabetes. So you sort of have put here whether or not it would be a cure. I would be doubtful if it would be able to reverse um, an autoimmune condition, but it may be able to be um, sort of um, preventative, perhaps, in that autoimmune condition. And again, I don't know what the mechanisms are for that. The, the problem is, is, of course, it's very difficult to sort of identify 
um, prevention when we don't know when type 1 diabetes is occurring in individuals. So I, I, from what I understand, type 1 vitamin D, that the trials that I have looked at or the studies that I've read very superficially around vitamin D and type 1 diabetes are slowing that sort of um, immune, autoimmune attack. So it may sort of delay the full-blown diabetes from happening, but I'm not aware of it being able to sort of really reverse or prevent type 1 diabetes from happening. Great. Terry Curry. And uh, James has just clarified in the chat box there. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm going back. Oh, hi, Blake. You're I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably like, I knew that. That's terrible. Oh, dear. HPS is high blood sugar and neuropenia is a condition. Yeah, uh, So let me just go back to that, the question there. There's a yeah. question. Yeah, okay. So the question is, oh, what do we call a high blood sugar cause? Oh, so like the, the brain having a higher demand for... Um, I'm not sure if I know how to answer that question. I'm really sorry. Jim, I apologize, and maybe you can email me directly and we can have a little conversation about it. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, thanks. Um, a question with Aisha here. Okay. How would, you, uh, how would diet play a role in eyelid treatment or protocol? Okay, I think that's a really interesting question, and I'm, I'm probably just going to be able to speculate, but if you can, mm -hmm. you can sort of bear with me there. So if we think about islet transplant um, in the context of type 2 diabetes, for example, so um, I was talking about that idea of lipotoxicity, and again, I'm coming back to an example about uh, in obesity, but um, diet maybe have a very significant role in a context like that. So in islet transplant, the islets are infused through the portal vein and actually lodge into the liver. So when I just told you there that we get that lipid spillover and fat accumulating in cells in peripheral tissues, including liver and pancreatic beta cells and skeletal muscle, muscle. if you had a type 2 diabetic that had received that islet transplant, those islets, whether they would be in the pancreas originally or if they are now in the liver from the transplant, would still, still be susceptible to that lipotoxicity. So changes in diet and, um, and lifestyle that can improve sort of circulating lipid levels would have a, the same impact on islets that were transplanted as sort of native islets in the pancreas. I hope that answers Great. the question. Okay. Yes, yeah. oh, it does for me. Thank you. Um, we have another one here. How do researchers get stem cells for experiments? Okay, so originally stem cells were, um, you know, originally stem cells must come from embryos. So there's a stage within the embryo that's called the blastocyst, and it's uh, it's an it's a mass of cells, and we can see that because in an embryo, those the start very starting out cells within the embryo have to have that potential to become any cell in the body, and that's originally where stem cells have been harvested from. Nowadays, there are commercially available stem cell lines, and the study that I showed you from Dr. Kiefer is one of those commercially available stem cell lines. Additionally, on that slide, I, I didn't go into the details of human embryonic stem cells versus other types of stem cells, but nowadays people are, instead of getting those cells from the embryos, they are trying to get, we have stem cells in adult tissues as well, but they have to sort of, we have to, um, make them overexpress proteins to stay in that kind of toddler phase where they have that potential to become anything. So nowadays, cells have been able to be generated in the lab. We sort of force them to become stem cells, and then those can be starting points as well. Because of course, the use of stem cells within itself is a very controversial area, which I don't, you know, don't mm -hmm. think necessarily this is the venue to get in, involved in that discussion. But it can be quite a controversial area. And so um, the the world of stem cell research within itself has developed a lot in terms of the availability to researchers and acceptable sources of, of stem cells. Because remember, for a while, you, the U.S. did not fund um, stem cell research that that what that where stem cells had been generated from embryonic tissue. So because of that freeze on funding, a lot of alternate sources for stem cells had to be generated. Great. Mm -hmm. um, this looks like a follow-up question from Aisha. Oh yeah. Um, okay. She says, so does the di diabetes eyelid treatment more relate to fats than carbohydrates, or as much as carbs? 
Yeah. So I talked. I talked a little bit about. Um, I talked mostly about this idea. I I was talking about this idea of lipotoxicity. We call it or lipid spillover. But remember, in the body, um, when we take in a lot of carbohydrates, um, initially we take in as we take in carbohydrates, they're used immediately for energy, as a source of energy. Then, if we have too many carbohydrates, we store them for a rainy day in the liver as glycogen, which you've probably heard of. But after mm -hmm. that, the body can then store sugar as lipid. So in your fat cells or in your liver, you can turn sugar into lipid. So when I say sort of lipid, I sort of mean excess calories, because whether that comes to us in the form of lipid, like fats in the diet, or too much sugar, ultimately the body can create lipid out of that sugar. Okay. <laughs> A bit of biochemistry for you. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. It looks like the questions are wrapping up. Um, I just have a question, and I'll see sure. if anybody else um, yeah. is posting anything here. Um, you, you mentioned at the beginning that there's a variety of topics, of course, for research. And I'm just wondering, is there a specific topic where the majority of research goes to, or is it fairly spread out? Or, you know, sometimes there's um, like a hot topic, anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely get sort of hot, hot topics in our fields, I would say for sure. And um, if I can use um, the Canadian Diabetes Association um, as an example, perhaps, um, it might be sort of a way that I can sort of illustrate how funds might be allocated. So it, the Canadian Diabetes Association research funds are allocated into three main streams for biomedical research. One is to research going on sort of related to islets. Another in the area of overall metabolism, so that might include areas like obesity research or, um, you know, sort of Physi physiology of beta cells or, or liver or muscle or, or fat. And then there's another area looking at complications. So that's an example of how one agency has decided to divide up their funds. Mm -hmm. But the Canadian government, which is our central funding body for health research, which is called CIHR, has, a, has one area which goes to uh, areas on diabetes, nutrition, and metabolism. And within that funding body, they may have a call. So you're right, a hot topic might come out, say we want specific work going on with stem cells. But I would say in diabetes research, it's probably actually where fairly well distributed across the, a variety of different, uh, different areas. Mm -hmm. But there may, at a particular time, be a particular call that you know is a hot topic, or, or they have a specific amount of funding to go be directed into a certain area. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting. I work for the BC Renal Agency, so of course we oh, look okay. at um, you know patient outcomes and research. So it's yeah. kind of curious as to the research and the diabetes, and it's so closely related to kidney yeah. disease. Totally, yeah, and I and also um, I should say too that I'm much more familiar with sort of the funding that goes to the biomedical world, but of course then there are other funding sources that will go to clinical trials. So they'll often have a separate pool of money that will go to drug mm -hmm. trials or a separate pool of money that goes to um, other aspects of diabetes research, say how like educational programs or how yes. social. Uh, social factors in, uh, influence the prevalence of diabetes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a question here for Joseph, from Josephine. Okay. Is there any research going on in Canada on the effects of bariatric surgery on diabetes? Um, yes, actually, I worked previously with Tim Kiefer's group, and they were very interested, for example, just giving you a specific example, of the effects of bariatric surgery on um, some of the gut hormones that are made. So I don't know how familiar you are with things like the incretin agents, but there are hormones made in the gut that are very important for how we regulate our blood sugar, and these hormones are called incretin hormones. And so when with bariatric surgery, for example, obviously removing part of the intestine or the gut will impact that hormone secretion. And so I just know, know sort of that that group was interested in studying that area. So there's a, there's a lot of groups that are looking at different aspects of bari bariatric surgery. So mm -hmm. the procedure itself, the outcomes, and, you know, any other side effects or implications from the surgery. I would imagine, yes, there's quite a lot of groups. And again, if you are particularly interested in, when, like, the names of them, please feel free to email me and I'll try to track that information down for you. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Aisha, I think we have a follow-up here. Uh, what, it, what I understand is that this again calls for controlled carbs even with eyelid transplant. Then what's the benefit of doing it? And then uh, she also mentions a healthy, balanced diet is the answer for every disorder. <laughs> yeah, so what I understand is that again calls for controlled carbs even with eyelid transplant, then what's the benefit of doing it? Uh, the benefit of doing it, i.e. the benefit of doing eyelid transplant? Is that, I think, I think that mm -hmm. might be, it looks yeah. like it, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you know, um, islet transplant is, as I highlighted for other reasons, so for example, the, the continued autoimmune attack, or in, in this case what you're saying, you're, you're still having to, to have the, um, you know, control of carbohydrates. The islet transplant doesn't take those other factors away. It just it does though provide insulin independence for patients for quite some time, and it's it's an alternate therapy to daily insulin injections or administration. And you know it's interesting because I think now it must have been about four years ago I attended one of the Canadian Diabetes Association meetings, and I met a patient there who had had islet transplant. And I think that prior to that, it's not really my area of research, and I hadn't interacted with patients before who had received that transplant and so I had sort of that similar like you know well, why are we doing this because they're just going to get dialects are just going to get attacked again but talking to this patient just made me realize he was so over the moon about this procedure that he had had that had made him insulin dependent and improved his day-to-day -day so dramatically and he was really so inspiring to hear speak and it made me realize that you know you know this is a really great therapeutic for those who get it. It's just right now there's a lot of limitations for, and not everybody can have it. So it really changed the way I guess I think about islet transplants because I remember him and I remember his face and, and just how over the moon he was by, um, you know, what this therapy had done for him in his life. But mm -hmm. I do agree with you that a healthy, balanced diet, um, it's an answer for every disorder. And I, I will always come back to my mother who has always told me from the very beginning, um, everything in moderation. And, and I think there's a lot to be said about that statement. Um, but I work a lot on, on obesity again. And remember, I think we need to remember, though, that for some people, um, maintenance of metabolism or, or body weight or whatever it be, it's a, it's a different battle for everybody. And so we have to be sympathetic to the fact that, you know, uh, so while some people will be more susceptible to the development of diabetes because of their genetic background, others will be more susceptible to the development of obesity because of their genetic background. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I come from a long line of thin people. And so for me, um, you know, it's, you know, I have a much easier time to maintain my weight than say my husband who comes from a family who's constantly battling their weight. So I think that the more we can understand about how genetics are involved or the physiology of these conditions, um, the more individualized we can make medicine and treatment. Great. Um, yeah, and she said thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we you. have a question for Gary here, from Gary. Uh, do you recommend insulin therapy over oral meds in type 2 diabetics? Okay, so I just need to preface. I'm not a I'm not a clinician, so I I try to not make any obviously any sort of uh, recommendations about what people's management should be because I just don't have yeah. that expertise. Um, but um, I think that so it just depends because the oral medications for type two diabetes um, they they act in a variety of different ways. So at the start of the talk, I think I talked about for example, sulfonylureas or gliburide, which will sort of promote insulin secretion from the islet, from the pancreatic beta cell, um, irrespective of if glucose is there. And so one of the severe side effects of that is, um, is hypoglycemia. But some of the newer drugs, like the incretin agents, they, do, they, they promote that insulin secretion in a much safer way. And actually, interestingly, what we're learning about the incretin agents as more and more patients are on these drugs for a longer period of time, they seem to have other effects that are actually sort of helping the disease state. So for example, incretin agents can help with the that restoring that pancreatic beta cell function in some of the, the beta cells that are left over. They may have effects on weight and other areas of metabolism. So, um, you know, I personally don't recommend either because, again, I'm not a clinician. But I think that what oral medications do is they allow patients to be 
insulin free so that they don't have to be having um, you know, daily injections. And some of the new drugs might actually work not only to replace that insulin, but to actually help the disease state. And so I think that we definitely want to still focus on generating new therapeutics for type 2 diabetes that um, can be taken orally, but maybe mending the disease process in addition to replacing that insulin. Great, thank you. Um, it okay. looks like I have, we have another question coming through the chat by Fred. I'll just wait till that um, comes through here. Okay. Um, And Ron says, thank you for brightening the future, and he appreciates oh, the webinar. That's very sweet. I, I really appreciate <laughs> I find it hard to know what level to pitch these at, so also if anybody has any feedback that mm -hmm. they'd like to give, because if I do them in future, I'm more than happy to adjust uh, the way I give the talk. So mm -hmm. No problem. Uh, a message uh, here's from Fred uh -huh. here. What yeah. are the differences between diamicron and metformin? Okay, so this is where you're getting me on my lack of <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Metformin I can tell you about, but I don't know diamicron, so unless you can give me a little bit more info, I might be, uh, I might be not be able to answer this one for you. No problem. Oh, yeah, I understand the, it is, some it of is the clinical drug, there. Yeah, some of the drug names and stuff. I have to tell you, I, I know the drugs in classes, but rather than sort of the individual names. So if you can help me with that, you guys are the experts on that, and if you can help me, that would be great. Yeah, I'll see if he responds. I know, I know the names because my, my mom's diabetic, so oh, I recognize okay. the names, but I can't tell you more That's than terrible. that. That's terrible. I should know. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, and I think oh. we have one more question coming oh. in here. I'm so impressed that all of you are here on Easter Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a great topic, so we all want to join in and listen. <laughs> okay, so it looks like that's all the questions. And if any questions come through while I'm just um, closing up, I'll still ask them just um, sure, the last yeah, kind of no minutes problem. to get in there. Um, so thank you much, so much, Sarah. It's really interesting. Okay. Um, it was you, great to see the success of um, the diabetes research and Canada really being in the forefront of it all. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. There's some mm -hmm. fantastic people doing such wonderful things across the country, and I feel very lucky to get to interact with these people. Yes, great. Mm -hmm. um, also, I just want to thank everybody who attended the webinar. Um, as Sarah mentioned, it's Easter Monday, and we had a great turnout and a lot of really interesting and thoughtful questions here. Um, and also thanks for the volunteers who were involved in coordinating the session. Yes, um, I just you. want to remind, sorry, um, I just want to remind everybody that we will be sending out an evaluation survey tomorrow, and we really encourage you to complete it. Um, the survey is short. It should only take about two minutes, and it will provide us with some valuable input to the association. Yeah, that would be great. I would love to sort of hear. I did, like I say, whenever I teach or give a seminar, I'd love to get some feedback just so that I know mm -hmm. how to do things in the future. So mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I know you said this is your your first like this, so you did great. My first webinar feels a bit odd <laughs> talking to people without seeing them. So <laughs> it's it is a different dynamic for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well thank um, you so much. Yeah, great. And just uh, the last thing here, this spring webinar series is generally supported by Lily, so thank you for that. Um, and also the development and delivery of impactful programs such as our very new Canadian Diabetes webinar series is made possible through the generous support of our donors. If you enjoyed the Road to a Cure webinar and would like to make a donation, please visit our website at diabetes.ca or call 1-800-BANTING. Uh, and again, thank you everybody for your support and your participation in today's webinar. And thanks a lot, Sarah, once again. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Bye, everybody. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. Thank you.